Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Uh, now you uh, probably all know the story of Princess Zosa, right? Um, how many of you know the story of Princess Zosa? Nobody, okay. Well, I've got to tell you the story of <laughs> Princess Joseph. You don't know that story. Many years ago, Princess Sosa would not or could not laugh. And her father, the king of Valle Pelosa, was very, very concerned. I'm so pleased to introduce to you Professor Jack Zipes. He's going to talk to us tonight about the Oxford Companion to Fairy Tales. Professor Zipes has edited, translated, and or written about the often overlooked genre of fairy tales throughout his academic career, and he's been involved in the production of over 30 books on the subject in some way or another. Suffice it to say, as has one of his colleagues, he is clearly the primary fairy tale scholar in the U.S. and one of its most prominent proponents worldwide. There are over 800 entries in this book delving into the very heart of our most beloved but little understood stories. In addition, the book covers a wide range of media to have dabbled in the art of storytelling, movies, opera, ballet, advertising, art. It explores the uses and often surprising themes dancing just beneath the surface of those stories. Professor Zipes currently teaches German at the University of Minnesota. He's an expert storyteller and a renowned scholar of children's literature. Welcome to Northern Lights. My name is Kati Kerner. I'm the Education Partnerships Coordinator at the Children's Theatre Company in Minneapolis. And we're here today at the Children's Theatre Company to speak with Jack Zipes, who is a renowned author and scholar and storyteller and a man of many, many talents. Um, Jack, how did you first get interested in storytelling? Well, it's a uh, long story, which I'll try to make uh, very short. Um, I used to uh, run a children's theater at, at, in uh, Milwaukee about uh, 20 some odd years ago and um, the children's theater w uh, lasted for about a couple of years and uh, I became burned out. I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee and I did want to continue my work with children and so I decided that I would try some storytelling experiments with children in schools and uh, that began my my career as a storyteller, uh, a novice who really didn't know too much about uh, storytelling and techniques and I began working in an inner city school in, in Milwaukee and uh, I did experimentation with storytelling with, with the intent to uh, try to analyze how fairy tales had an effect on uh, their values, on, on uh, their notions of gender, racism, and things like that. And uh, once I um, began doing the, the experimentation and began taking notes and uh, kept a journal, I did a diary, and I began uh, developing slowly a, a method where uh, in which I tried to help the uh, children become storytellers themselves. That, that was the goal, is the goal of, of all of my storytelling, to use storytelling so that children would discover their own talents uh, in terms of reading, writing, acting, drawing. And um, when I left uh, the University of Wisconsin um, in 1986, I went to um, the University of Florida. And wherever I go, I've, I've done some storytelling for three months or five months in, in, in a particular school. 
And after that, after I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville, I came here in 1989 and began doing freelance work uh, during the 1990s. And uh, eventually um, uh, worked in different schools at the Pillsbury School, the Anderson School. Um, I did some work in Marcy School. I, 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 but basically, I, I was not involved in, in, in a program. And uh, fortunately, uh, three years ago, as you know, well know, I became involved in a program here at the Children's Theater. Can you tell us a little bit more about that Neighborhood Bridges program? I know it's also based on a, a book of yours called mm -hmm. Creative Storytelling. That's right. Building Community and Changing Lives. Right. Uh, well, well uh, the, I was very, very fortunate because about three or four years ago, uh, I received a phone call from Herb Cole, who is one of the foremost progressive educators in, in, in America. And uh, he began working with the Open Institute, which is uh, f funded by George Soros in New York. And uh, they were funding special projects in the country that had to do with the arts. And he had been here in Minneapolis and had met with me and Peter Brosius. And, um, thought that uh, we might um, do a special project with regard to storytelling. And um, that um, grant that he provided uh, uh, enabled Peter Brosius and myself uh, to develop Neighborhood Bridges. And of course, you came along, fortunately, uh, to uh, help run the, uh, the program. And the essence of that program, the concept of, the, of that program, was developed by Peter and myself, uh, in, in which uh, w we decided that we would use storytelling as a way to develop the critical literacy and the imagination of children, in, primarily in the elementary schools, although we were open to working with the high schools. And uh, we began working in two schools, uh, the Whittier School and the Lucy Laney School, um, with uh, actors whom I trained from the children's theater to uh, work through uh, for two hours every week for the whole year to work through a special program that would familiarize themselves, uh, the children, the students, with different genres like the fairy tale, the legend, uh, the uh, fable, uh, tall tales, family tales. Some of you have participated in storytelling in Mr. Canal's uh, class um, Last year, how many have done that? Uh, oh, great! So you you know sort of what we're going to do today. Some of you haven't, so this is going to be a new game, some storytelling and play acting. And what we uh, do in the, in this program is we get them almost immediately, within three to five minutes, uh, to uh, begin telling tales that they write and then enact and also tell uh, their fellow uh, schoolmates. So we work, we begin uh, with this uh, method, as you know, the fantastic binominal, which is just wonderful because it gets children uh, to, who, who've never written before, who have never spoken before, have never stood before a class, within five or 10 minutes, uh, we get them out before the, uh, before the rest of the class and they're telling their tales, they're writing their tales. Some some other uh, definitions of a hero. When when you think of a hero, what do you think of? Um, a role model. A, a role model. Okay. A role model. Okay. Some other heroes. Anybody? Yes. I think you look up to a hero. So, somebody you look up to. Okay. Any any other any other people? Yes. Someone who saves your life. Somebody who saves your life. That's great. These are great definitions of a hero. Yeah. Hercules. Oh, Hercules. Man. Okay. What about from books? Any, anything from books that you've been reading? Yes? Harry Potter. Harry Potter, okay. Okay. Uh, yes? Wonder Woman. What? Oh, uh, okay, oh, we have Superwoman, Wonder Woman. Here's what you, the, the game is. I want you to choose, you, you have a choice. Any one of these superheroes on the board, okay, you can use any one of the linking words, but then you have to use plain. I want you to write a story. Begin writing, and if you need any help with spelling or ideas or anything like that, you can raise your hand, and I'll help you, or Mr. Canal will help you, okay? So, uh, you know, whenever you need any help, just let us know. And we're going to share the stories. Well, that's a 
upon a time there was a girl named Gina. She got on a plane with her enemy, and then she didn't know she was going to turn her into her enemy. Then she had got, they had gotten a big fight, and then there was a war. Superman had powers in his eyes, and it was something like there's a burn, it could burn you, and it could burn them. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so why not? And then, of course, we do some storytelling to model uh, in, in, in our program, as you know. Um, we don't use the stories to uh, show how good we are as storytellers or, or to sort of exhibit our great uh, talents as storytellers. What we really want to do is to give them a sense of how stories can be told and also to get them to think about stories because we t we, a lot of the fairy tales are sexist or racist and uh, we want them to think about these tales and we also we, so we give them counter tales and uh, try to get them to think about possibilities to uh, alter these tales to change the, these tales so that they will begin creating their own tales and yeah he flew up on top to the mountain and he started fighting with the dragon and the dragon changed into many many different forms and each time the dragon changed into a gorilla the dragon changed into a little monkey, into a, and then all of a sudden into a tiny mouse, and Superman grabbed the mouse and held it in his hands, and he said, where is Lois? Where is Lois? So we use a combination of, of acting, of uh, drawing, of writing, of re and then we also do follow-ups during the week with the teachers. And we work very, very closely with the schools. And of course, you've done a great deal of work in terms of your coordination with this program, um, linking two schools together, the Lucy Laney and uh, the Whittier School. The, uh, the students write letters to one another during the year. They eventually get to perform in each other's schools. They get to know one another, and they get to share their work. And uh, the program has become so successful thanks to the uh, commitment of the Children's Theater, uh, thanks to the commitment of the actor educators and the teachers involved and the, and the principals and so on, that we're expanding uh, this coming year into, uh, we're keeping the Whittier School, the Lucy Laney School, and we're going to expand the program into the Tuttle School and also the uh, Marcy School. And uh, again, bridging all of these schools, trying to bring them together and uh, basically focusing on, on the children, really getting them to become storytellers of their own lives. Okay, so you divide up the roles, and if somebody plays a narrator, and you say you have to double up on the roles sometimes, okay? We're going to act out the plays. Now, I know you didn't have enough time for rehearsal, but I, I saw some good things. And, and what we're going to do in theater, we call this improvisation, in other words, that as you go along, you make up things, okay? That, in other words, even though you didn't get a full time to rehearse your skits, you make up things because you more or less know the story as, as you go along. And the girl told Tina to go home and she ran away from the giant. And they tossed the giant to the tree and pushed him into the lake. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I always thought was really striking about the program is that you insist on um, giving the students a basis in traditional mm -hmm. fairy tales, yeah. yet you have a very strong critical stance. That right. you, like you just said, right. that you know many of these tales are sexist, racist. Right. Can you say something about why you think it's so important for them to know the classics and then be able to yes. critique them? Yes, uh, I, I think it's extremely important uh, for all children or students, uh, no matter what age level they are, to have some sort of familiarity with the classics, uh, classical fairy tales or classical literature in general, because our culture uses these um, books or stories or poems and music as reference points that they will need to know as they move, move on in society and uh, so that they understand the dominant culture. Um, I, I'm not necessarily saying that all of the dominant culture or high culture or the classical culture 
is the culture that we should um, uh, revere. Uh, but it's the culture that, it's a code that is very, very important uh, for children, particularly young children, to know and also to know it critically. So that uh, a tale like Little Red Riding Hood, which is essentially a tale about rape and violation, though it's not, it's not very explicit about that, but uh, which, which, uh, a tale which portrays little girls as dumb and stupid and naive, uh, that particular tale is a tale we tell because every child should know the classical version of Little Red Riding Hood, but we don't stay there. We introduce another very artistic, qualitatively uh, an, an artistic tale that we tell in our program called uh, Little Polly Riding Hood and the Stupid Wolf as a counter tale uh, to that. And so we work off a lot of the uh, classical tales that we uh, uh, question and think should be questioned, but we also introduce uh, classical tales that unfortunately children don't know today. For instance, I've recently done some work on popular heroes in the school, and I uh, introduced John Henry. The railroad, the head of the railroad said, On your mark, get set, go! And the machine went, choo 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 and started digging rapidly a big hole through that mountain. And John Henry, he had two pickaxes one in one hand and one in the other, and he went boom, 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 digging through that tunnel. And he kept up with that machine, but he The machine and John Henry had a race. <laughs> it's a tale that they, that, that should be part of their cultural heritage. So this is part of, of uh, our program is to increase the, uh, the literacy that is uh, uh, their knowledge of the children, but to increase it in a way that they can think about what they're getting instead of being fed like television or movies uh, as though it were candy, just some candy that they should swallow and enjoy. We want them to enjoy what they're doing, but the pleasure should be meaningful. I'm, I'm very appreciative that the program is here at Lucy Laney, and I'm, I'm very thankful that I'm, I'm part of it. We're expanding this year. We have another fourth grade class that's it will become active with it. Uh, we hope and we know that it will drastically change the lives of students and we hope that that their writing and that their reading will be incorporated into this and they read, read more. I mean it's nothing, nothing can surpass that whole thing of reading. The uh, Minnesota Humanities uh, Commission has a teacher's institute that has been running for the last uh, I, I think almost 10 years and I've had the privilege of uh, working with the Teachers Institute for the last five or six years and I've done about three or four different uh, workshops with teachers on fairy tales and the work that we have done has been really fascinating I hope for the teachers certainly for me it has been because I've learned a great deal about conditions in schools and uh, how teachers uh, try to teach fairy tales and myths and legends as well as storytelling uh, to their students. Well, it's sort of also a theme that seems to run through a lot of your work. I mean, you're the author of almost 40 books, and in a lot of them, you spend a lot of time, like in Don't Bet on the Prince or um, Fairy Tales and After. Um, you spend a lot of time pointing out right. different critiques or critical stances that you can right. assume vis-a-vis -vis fairy tales. Can right. you um, tell us something about how you got interested in Yes. in researching fairy tales and how you develop this sort of critical stance? Or? Right. Well, it, it, there was nothing uh, that happened in my childhood, nothing traumatic <laughs> or uh, no, uh, nothing that I can remember that really stamped uh, me or would indicate that I would become involved uh, uh, with fairy tales. I think what happened was I'm not necessarily a child of the 1960s, but I, I certainly was very, very much influenced by the student movement and the New Left movement at the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s. And I was teaching at New York University and I became very, very uh, involved in a course that uh, dealt with fairy tales and, and German romanticism and began thinking that uh, uh, these tales, really, uh, particularly fairy tales, stay with you your entire life. You're born with them, you g 
grow up with them. Uh, when you become a, a, a parent, you tell them or f go out and purchase fairy tales until you're a grandparent and you continue uh, using fairy tales and tales like that. And uh, so the value systems uh, in, in these tales, whether they are just literature or film or uh, a theater piece or even opera, because fairy tales are all over the place, even in commercials, um, I began interested in investigating to what extent the tales are used as part of a socialization process or a, a civilization process. And uh, when I left New York University in the early 70s to go to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, I continued teaching these courses be and became involved in children's theater and felt also a commitment to um, coming out of my new left commitment uh, that I would like to help uh, socialize children in a different way, in an, in, in an alternative way to the way in which I had been socialized, which I won't go into at, at this particular point. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, I began writing essays about the fairy tale and the media. I began writing fairy tales about the history of, of fairy tales because most people don't realize that um, fairy tales for children were not really told or written down until, uh, until about the 18th century, which is rather recent, and that most children had heard all types of tales, oral tales, bawdy tales, erotic tales. Um, they were not separated out the way we try to protect children today by sanitizing uh, these tales. So I became very, very involved in writing books about uh, one of the, my first books was called Breaking the Magic Spell, in which I tried to break the spell or myths about, about fairy tales by looking at the history of, of the fairy tales. And about that time that I wrote this book, uh, Bruno Bettelheim had come out with his book called The Uses of Enchantment. And though Bruno Bettelheim is a respected or was a respected psychologist, or maybe he's not so respected now uh, because of uh, many things that have come out about his work in Chicago with autistic children and uh, also questionable ideas uh, about his Freudian approach to, to fairy tales. Uh, at that time, his book did come out in, I believe, 1976, and I became so incensed by his imposing sort of this Freudian or neo-Freudian uh, schema on fairy tales that I decided uh, to explore one fairy tale uh, to uh, show historically uh, and also psychologically and ideologically that uh, the tale was open to many different interpretations, that there were about 500 different versions. And, uh, and I explored basically uh, from another or uh, uh, sort of a feminist socio-historical socio perspective how uh, Little Red Riding Hood was indeed or is indeed a tale about violation and, and about rape. And uh, I produced this book called uh, uh, The Trials and Tribulations of uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And about the same time, I finished another book which was called Fairy Tales and the Art of Subversion, in which I, I showed how, going back to the 16th century, how the development of this literary genre was very, very much in tune with the way the upper classes tried to civilize or, or bring about sort of a, a civil code of manners and values in France, in Germany, in England, and, uh, and, and in the United States. And the topic is so immense that uh, uh, one book has led to another book, to another study, to, uh, to stimulate me in, in, in all sorts of ways uh, beyond anything I had ever anticipated that I just keep <laughs> writing about, uh, about this topic and always surprising myself because I've found uh, new things to say. I uh, found uh, uh, people keep writing fairy tales, fairy tale novels, fairy tale novellas, short fairy tales, parodies, and so on. And of course, that led to the Oxford Companion to fairy tales. So how do you choose from among that vast, <laughs> vast store of material and right. all those years of experience working with it? How do you even go about making a 
Oxford companion <laughs> to fairy tales? Well, that that was fortunate. That, that was easy. Uh, that that is the making of the book was not easy. But um, about three or four years ago, uh, a, an editor at Oxford University Press in Oxford, England, contacted me and and asked me whether I would do this mammoth uh, reference book and. I hesitated because I, I knew it would be a, f a fair amount of work, but uh, also realized that there had n no one had ever done this type of a reference book. And uh, I decided, because they promised me a great deal of editorial assistance, that I would plunge ahead into this project. And I began contacting before I even set up lists of what fairy tales would be included or fairy tale postcards, fairy tale uh, stamps. Uh, there, there were going to be categories like that in this book. Um, I began contacting all the scholars I knew uh, in, in the world, actually, and uh, fortunately uh, found about 90 to 100 different scholars who were willing to write entries. And uh, the book took about three years to complete. Uh, and I'm very, very happy uh, with, the, uh, with the results because of the fact that uh, these scholars wrote really superb entries and short essays and practically every, everything you want to know about the literary fairy tale in the West is in, this, uh, is in this Oxford book. And I hope it will stimulate people to go way beyond me and my own work uh, that, that I hope will be part of my my legacy in, in the field of scholarship. Well, now that you've written the, uh, a gigantic, perhaps definitive guide to fairy tales, what are, what are you working on now? What are you interested in doing next? Well, uh, I, I'm probably, um, uh, this fall I have a book coming out called Sticks and Stones, The Troublesome Success of Children's Literature from Slovenly Peter to Harry Potter. And I think when people read my chapter on Harry Potter, I'll, be, I'll go down in history as the most villainous critic uh, in, in the world. Uh, that's my next project that I'm finishing right now. And after that, I'll be going back to uh, doing a, a huge anthology called The Great Tradition of the Fairy Tales, which uh, will be published by Norton. And that's an anthology of all the tales that preceded the Brothers Grimm. And I'm looking forward to finishing that project as well. Wonderful. It sounds wonderfully well, interesting. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Northern Lights. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you at home. And when Prince Tadio heard this fairy tale, he realized the truth of her story. And he summoned his guards, and he told his guards to take the slave maiden, all pregnant, and to bury her alive. And on the next day, Prince Tadio married Princess Zotza, and they lived happily ever after. Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers, is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book, a program of the Minnesota Humanities Commission, with funding provided by Target Stores, and the Elmer L. and Eleanor J. Anderson Foundation. Mm -hmm.